Well, I hope all of you um, are, are, are certainly on with us uh, virtual today. My name is uh, Dr. Enid Stiles, and today I'm going to be moderating this first of three webinars on our Veterinary Workforce Shortage mini-series. Uh, I am the last year's uh, president of the CVMA, so I'm uh, currently on my way out, but happy to continue to contribute as much as I can. And this is certainly an area that I um, am very close to, uh, that we've been working extremely hard with at the CVMA. Uh, and never have we felt our workforce more in this shortage uh, than in the last couple of years. So before I introduce our speaker, um, I'll just let you know that uh, in case we finish too early, you don't see my last slide, we will be having two more mini series coming forward in the next two Wednesdays. So February 9th and February 16th. On February 9th, it's with Rob Marr and it's on improving you and your team. And then on February 16th, we have Team Culture by Dr. Irene Moore. So very much looking forward to seeing these three um, webinars, certainly very pertinent and important information. So today it's going to be on recruitment and retention. And as a small animal practitioner and an owner of a practice, I can say that this is for me uh, extremely important and has been something that I've been struggling with uh, for the past years. So just as a little housekeeping today, um, please make sure you, plus you keep yourself on mute at all times. Uh, we highly suggest turning off your video just because it sometimes gets a little bit busy with the signals, et cetera, but uh, that's entirely up to you. And we'd also encourage you to send us some questions. So we're, we have a chat box you'll see at the bottom of your screen with Zoom, and you can send us a little note. We're going to try our best to get to those questions. Um, and if we can, then that's, that's great. If we can't, we'll try to get back to you with the answers as well. Make sure that the actual name that's on your um, Zoom is in fact a name that we might be able to find you at if you're one of our members, okay? And we'll try to reach out to you, but we'll do our best to get there. Super. So I'm just going to come out of that screen because I lost, I'm working with two screens and things never work out the way I want them to. So, um, I'm going to introduce now Dr. John Tate. I have been fortunate to know Dr. Tate since I was in school just a couple of years ago, really. Um, no, <laughs> it was one of his early years, in fact, teaching at OBC. And uh, we were very, very fortunate to have him. And you are still, if you go to OBC and, and other colleges that receive him to teach business management uh, and other aspects of our that part of our world as a profession, uh, you're very fortunate. So Dr. John Tate uh, graduated from the Ontario Veterinary College in 1986 and received his MBA in 1995 uh, from McMaster London School of Business in Health Services Management. He received a combined Master's of Finance Certified Financial Planner in 2001. And he also has a certification in business valuation, having valued practices for over 20 years and is a certified in mediation and negotiation from Harvard. He has experience as a mixed animal practitioner and companion animal practitioner in private practice for 10 years where he owned his own practices. He also has experience in multi-unit corporate medicine as vice president of Veterinary Centers of America while based in the US and in academia as director of the Veterinary Teaching Hospital at OBC where he is still a part-time faculty member. He was managing partner of the OVG, so Ontario Veterinary Group, a practice consolidation group from 2002 until 2014. In 2009 until 2010, he was in fact president of the American Animal Hospital Association. He currently owns his own consulting business, John Tate Veterinary Consulting. He is a private consultant to healthcare professionals in the areas of practice management and transition, operations efficiency, valuation, and various aspects of career and personal business financial planning. And he is an active member of the veterinary management groups as a member of the board of directors. So on that note, I'm going to pass it along back to Dr. Tate, who's going to take it over. And again, feel free to leave your questions. Um, I'll do my best to answer them or we will do the best to answer them at the end if we can. Good, thank you, Unid. Uh, appreciate that, and welcome everybody. Uh, good afternoon or good morning for wherever you're uh, listening in from. 
either now or on a recorded version in the future. As Zine had mentioned, you know, if there is questions, we will do our best to get back to you. I'm not sure I have a lot of extra time today, but we will see how it goes. I'm pleased to be part of this uh, three-part mini-series. And the way that I wanted to approach this today is start off just with a little bit of a little bit of theory and data. And uh, one of my missions was to kind of pull together some of the current theory and data that's out there on recruitment and retention, as everybody knows, coming out of the pandemic. Uh, it's been an issue, whether you're trying to recruit veterinarians, whether you're trying to recruit uh, other team members into your practice, large animal, small animal, certainly some of the effects I think are in part of our current delivery model. But um, it is becoming definitely a stressor for many practice operators or those going through transitions as well. So really, I have kind of a couple overarching objectives today. The third is first is really to understand kind of the, what I call the motivators behind recruitment and retention. And we're going to show you some data on that that really start in an earlier career time period for veterinarians, because most of you that are owners out there or are really entrenched in your practices or managers have been there for a while, you know, you're there, you're the ones that are leading the recruitment and the retention effort. And it really does depend largely on where the individuals, and I'm gonna focus mostly in the interest of time on veterinarians today, although I've got a few things for you on recruitment and retention of staff out of the research data. So that overarching uh, objective is goal number one. Uh, goal number two really is to introduce kind of a little bit of out of the box model, and that'll tie in to what are really highly ranked retention motivators by veterinarians as they proceed a little bit further along in their career and are finding potentially opportunities for practice management, practice ownership rather becoming less. So I've pulled on a number of references here um, that are fairly broad based, as you didn't mention, very uh, involved with the veterinary management groups, which is really the single largest database of practice performance for veterinary practices anywhere in the world, uh, representing just under $4 billion in economic activity. Some generic ones, not veterinary related, but have done research into the veterinary sector, and then some acronyms and individuals that will look familiar to you as well. So really, when you are recruiting uh, any individual or trying to retain them, or really making any decision in your practice, you're managing risk. And there really only are five types of risk that exist in our marketplace, really five categories of risk. The top two though, no one individual can control in a perfectly competitive marketplace. And veterinary practices, they're not monopolies, they're not oligopolies, we exist in what's called a perfectly competitive marketplace, which means really no one business can control what's happening in the market. It tends to be a trend. It tends to be uh, a majority of um, where the individual enterprises or business units are going. But what you are managing on a day-to-day -day basis as practice owners or decision makers on this call every single day is those bottom three. You're certainly managing the ups and downs, the tremendous volatility we've seen in the last couple of years and practices, day-to-day -day business risk. And when you're looking at hiring or retaining someone and there's a financial impact and there's a, a, a hierarchy or an order of salaries and seniority and benefits and so on in your practice, you know, you're managing the business risk around that, as well as other decisions that you are making. Uh, practice owners nowadays are very well aware as are veterinarians seeking jobs, what the competitive marketplace is like. Um, what are my competitors doing? What are the corporate aggregators and so on doing as well? Where is the marketplace trending? And how do I respond or differentiate myself from that competitive risk? And the final one, there's always an implication on career planning. And for these younger veterinarians, the career planning risk Sorry, did I just go on mute there for a second? It's okay, you're back on now. I'm back on now, sorry. I think that was my internet connection. So did you hear the part about competitive risk? Did I get through that? We just got there, yeah. Okay, good, perfect, sorry. So the final one, career planning risk, 
And I think right now, a lot of practice owners, when they look at transitioning out of practice at a potentially earlier age than they would have traditionally, or are frustrated by their inability or struggles to recruit and retain, are looking at potentially exit from practice ownership and the qualitative benefit of not having to deal with that anymore as a way they're going to manage not only their business risk, but their career planning risk as well. So this is really underlying every decision. And, and I understand that. And I understand that there's limitations in practices and so on as well. But the reality is right now, we have a supply and demand issue. And today I'm gonna to talk about more or less differentiate, differentiating yourself uh, and, and being aware of what kind of reward theory and recruitment theory and so on is all about where some innovation is going. But at the end of the day, no matter whether you're dealing with automobiles or all the things you hear about in our supply chain nowadays, or whether we're dealing with veterinarians, where there is a supply and demand issue and demand exceeds supply, the price of any commodity is naturally by market force is going to go up as we've seen happen with salaries and so on. And there are going to be individual business enterprises that for a variety of reasons, some of them strictly based on their recruiting tactics, their location, their size, the species mix, the responsibilities, the job description, the compensation, whatever it is, are going to struggle um, to recruit or retain anybody. So I wish I had a magic bullet to say, do this, do that, and we'll overcome the uh, supply issues of veterinarians and staff members. There is no magic solution for that. In fact, you know, to put a little bit of a dark cloud over this, the predictions, including this one from AVMA, when you see the mean median age of practice owners across North America, is that this supply issue is likely going to tighten further. We anticipate that when the pandemic kind of releases some of the restrictions, and there's an increased number of veterinarians now not working full time, delaying maternity leaves to come back because they have infant children at home, uh, just having um, stress related problems or throughput of client problems in practices and so on as well. That's causing an, what we call an effective supply issue. But over the next the period of this surge, which is anticipated with a buildup of supply of pets and companion animal as well, but in other industry sectors, including large animal and equine sector too, probably to continue to be tight for a number of years because our supply of practicing veterinarians based in particular on the age of owners being replaced by non-veterinarians is going to continue to be an issue. So it kind of becomes a little bit about differentiation as well. So a little bit of theory here. I think if you ever get a chance to hear anybody um, from the University of Denver, if you see them on a CE program and they pop up on some of the bigger US conferences and so on as well, they have done a great job. They're affiliated with American Animal Hospitals, Veterinary Management Institute modules and so on. And really, um, I don't pretend to be an HR expert, but these guys definitely are. And really what happens in recruitment, there's sort of a subliminal expectation whenever you're recruiting anybody on your part and on the part of the individual that you are recruiting as well. And the idea in the perfect world when it comes to recruitment is you're gonna meet right in the middle. All four of these expectations are going to be met. And it really starts right at the beginning of the awareness creation. So that may be you contact someone, the practice puts an ad in, someone contacts you, you network it from somebody else, whatever it is. Uh, but there's a certain set of expectations here on the part of the employee and the employer. And when those expectations are met, you know, the reality is in our profession nowadays, some of ABMA's work from last year, that whether a, a veterinarian is an associate, full-time associate, whether they consider themselves a relief vet, whether they're in private practice or in some form of public practice, we do still have a fairly high level of job satisfaction, which I think is a good thing a little bit higher on the part of owners. I mean, you might even say that's significantly higher, I think because they do have some more control um, over their own destiny and so on and uh, creating their own work-life balance and the culture that they're working in and so on as well. So it's not like the compensation and workplace environment and so on that is out there and practices in North America nowadays is detrimental at all. So it is not necessarily indicating that practices should look at full scale uh, changes in their delivery models and so on. We do still have an issue or you know, a, a positive 
a positive profile of the experience and practice. But what we're seeing now, and again, this is where we have a situation where demand exceeds supply. So reward theory or the, the expectation here is that these two boxes that I've blown up here start to don't start to become more prevalent. So now companies, you being the practice owner, you're the company, you know, whether you're a big company, a corporate aggregator, or you're a small practice, the marketplace trend is dictating now that the company is expecting I'm going to have to give more um, to hire somebody. You know, we're in an inflationary period, demand is greater than supply. And on the flip side of that, the employees coming in, based on the fact that a uh, situation where you have demand greater than supply increases the leverage of those that are the supply. And I don't care whether they're coming right out of school without 10 minutes experience in practice, or they've been out 10 years, or they're a relief vet, or whatever it is, it increases their ability to cherry pick, it increases their leverage, and it increases the pressure on the business to find out what else can I give here, given that I have to manage business risk, I have to manage my bottom line, I require a certain level of productivity out of those veterinarians, I have three other associates in my practice that I hired five years ago, they're nowhere near this salary, how do I potentially differentiate myself? So the key is continuing with the theory, before I kind of get a little bit more tactical here too, is that the rewards have to be perceived as valuable to um, the prospective employees coming in. And if they are perceived, that will generally draw them in. And whether it's the uh, interview process or whatever kind of a realistic job preview you give on your workplace environment and your full compensation benefit package and so on as well, during that recruitment process, the idea will be you will retain that employee. So the question is, you know, what are the perceived rewards and how do they tie in to where are those veterinarians in their, their particular career? So I'll show you a few graphs here where it actually starts to involve. I think what we've seen in the industry largely is the one that is the easiest to do. And the easiest to do um, is the third one there. So there really are four types of rewards. Some of them are more internal type rewards where they may be practices that will offer a monetary or non-monetary award. You know, you see it in everything from McDonald's to veterinary practices where they're pull effect rewards to give the staff ownership over the direction of a business to show that they're having impact on their suggestions and so on, good culture builders and so on. The so-called employee suggestion rewards that would come out during meetings or rounds. And then there are the sales goal rewards um, we see that in practices that are paying on pro-sal or productive-based compensation to veterinarians. Those are sales goal rewards. You earn more for the practice, you're going to make more. That's a sales goal reward as an incentive and so on. The formal reward, which I'm certainly seeing all over the place, and many of you probably have considered, though the corporate aggregators are using it, um, isn't necessarily a sales goal reward, but it would be increasing compensation as a flat rate amount. Primarily what we're seeing now is in terms of like a signing bonus or a retention bonus. And the assumption on that is that money talks the most. Now I would push back on that a little bit from an HR perspective and I'll show you as we go through here, it's important, don't get me wrong, but the formal reward is not it on its own. So I think that practices can differentiate themselves but looking to sort of tie different rewards in. Reward theory also shows that the best reward pattern um, for individuals in any business is not when they're pattern rewards. So not necessarily, I'm gonna give you something now, you're gonna get something at the end of a year, or for all you staff members, um, you know, at, when Christmas comes around, I'm gonna sign you, I'm gonna give you a Christmas bonus. I have never been a fan of cash Christmas bonuses. They're pattern rewards. They very quickly become the expected. And in fact, in reward theory and HR theory, this is out of the University of Denver as well, that actually there's a lot of impactful non-cash rewards as well. I'm gonna go through what they are when we get into the tactics as well. Because a cash reward very quickly becomes the expected and doesn't necessarily have often as much residual effect 
as combining not only the categories of rewards, but the pattern in which you um, present them. This is kind of an interesting one. I don't have a lot to say today really on non-veterinary staff as well, um, but this is basically the ranking of rewards um, for non-veterinary staff. So again, you see money there, particularly the retention bonus. So not the one that's up front. It's like, I got my bonus, I banked it, I spent it, you know, and now the things that are bugging me in this business are still bugging me, but the retention bonus, sort of the anniversary clause bonus, whatever it is. In fact, they quantified those as to, okay, what size bonus is impactful? Is it like 1% of a staff member salary? And really anything over 10%, up, you know, around 10% was considered impactful for non-veterinary staff, making anywhere from, you know, 15 to $25 or an hour, whatever it is. So any of these, as far as something that can be flagged in an ad or part of your culture is considered value added when it comes to retention of staff and they're differentiating, do I want to stay here? Or is somebody else offering me something better? Veterinarians are a little bit different. I'm going to come to that. The last kind of couple of slides I had on the theory is not to forget about messaging and the platforms and so on. You know, for our clients nowadays, social media is all the rage. 85% of clients now look at testimonials before they choose to come to a veterinarian from clients who have been there. But if you have that same kind of thing from past staff members, you know, that works. But I think the messaging, no matter where it is, really needs to hit some key words. So what I did was, this is just kind of a uh, advertisement for a receptionist that's rather generic. It doesn't really hit on any of the keys. I won't spend too much time going through this line by line. But essentially, there's really no clues to the workplace environment. There's no specificity what several years means. There's no specificity on what the qualifications there are. And there's no sort of why would I want to work here versus this one. And this is kind of a wordy slide. And I certainly don't mind sharing these after the fact. But really, you know, this ad, a little more wordy, is more effective for, say, recruiting a technician just because it hits on what we call flags and, and flags when people are looking basically are indicators of what the workplace environment is going to be and uh, what the expectations are, physical demands and so on as well, potentially what benefits are offered, what to do and where to go kind of thing. Little things, but important on differentiating in a restricted supply and demand environment. So that's just a little bit of kind of generic theory there. I'm going to put my financial planner's hat on here for a second. This is something I use in lectures all the time, including showing to students or owners, because really one of the key background issues with someone choosing a particular practice to go and work in, and this is really more for professionals, everybody on this call, whether you realize it or not, as you go through your working career, you know, based on kind of hitting the workplace, maybe late 20s to early 30s, retiring around 60 years old, you're moving through five what we call life stages. And the motivations on picking a job are very different when people move through the different life stages, particularly early. Because for those of you looking to recruit and retain a veterinarian, chances are they're going to be in one of these first two boxes. Just to run through them quickly here, and then I'll go through the motivators with you. You know, veterinarians with an average graduation age of kind of late 20s, or professionals in general, you know, for the first five years or so, really what their focus is on then really will be things like debt. What is my compensation? You know, what is my workplace experience going to be like in terms of, of mentoring and easing into practice and so on? Am I going to be... Uh, committed there for a long period of time, you know, am I going to be able to afford to live there? Um, I'm, am I going to be mobile myself and maybe look for a shorter term position? So in fact, when people in that newer grad age group, what they're not looking for is what they are in this one here. This is actually when 85% of veterinarians will take on a practice ownership position, typically between their early 30s and their mid 40s. After that, um, some will do it, but most are pretty entrenched as associates in that particular position. So then they start thinking about equity opportunities, accumulation of property, settling down in an area, putting money into retirement. What does the practice offer for those types of things? My workplace environment shifts 
the motivator shift, as I'm going to show you subsequently here. So with actually more practices now coming on the market in the next five years, and there probably is people to buy them, groups of owners will almost always ask me, who should I try and recruit if I'm looking at an internal succession plan? And this would go for the corporate aggregators here. And it's this group right here, because as people move through their mid to late 40s into their mid to late 50s, motivation changes in terms of their ability to be mobile, move to a new practice. Usually it would be somebody in a, in a given area and so on as well. And they might even start be starting to dial back their hours. So we certainly see now, you know, a lot of veterinarians in this marketplace with considerable experience, maybe 20 years experience, shifting to become relief vets or locums because they fits with the motivators here. I don't have to be as accountable. I'm putting money away. I can control my own schedule and so on. Those become motivators. Right now, this little box here, which is typically kind of from mid 50s to age 60s, that's where half the practice owners in North America are right now because of the wave of graduates that were you know, graduated kind of back in the disco era and the early 80s there that are now looking really to recruit and retain, not necessarily for the short term, but they might to have that veterinary security there for transition either to independent vets or a corporate aggregator. One of the biggest risk metrics now they're looking at is veterinary security and productivity. And you know now we're seeing more, I'm certainly seeing more offers by corporate aggregators risk shift to owners based on any uncertainty in that area. So owners are maybe looking to recruit to have, be able to have veterinary stability and somebody share in that equity. And finally, the last one, you know, is kind of age mid 60s and beyond where most owners are starting to retire. So what, what are the motivators? And I think the key is in the messaging here, and this was done through the uh, national VBMA um, in the US, but also picking up some Canadian schools and early grads as well, and a VMG product project as well. So kind of in that early career, um, stage when you're looking to recruit and the numbers you see at the top are the percentages surveyed that said this is important show this to me when you're screening me or when you're advertising to try and get me some of it you can't do certainly in an initial ad and so on but during the screening process where they're making a decision these are differentiating factors that newer grads want to see. So we call it early career. I think the cutoff here was up to about age 33 or 34. Large animal, small animal, equine, all the same because they're all part of the same demographic as well. The one that's a little bit vague, you know, I think having CE in there, most people do that. You'll see these two here, low risk equity and high risk equity, you know, which is actually becoming an owner, not important in the early career stage because of where they are and what their motivators are. Perceived fair compensation, I'm gonna show you what that is. Getting feedback, having that mentoring, easing into practice, reducing the stress and so on, and their assessment of the workplace work very high. So when you look at the assessment of the workplace, what does that mean? What are they saying that they wanna see? Well, part of the workplace is what you can't control. It goes back to the overall business risk and competitive risk. And that is, I know that there's or somebody down the road offered this, or I know the marketplace is that, or I have competing offers. So I think there is some merit when it comes to pure compensation packages, whether it's guaranteed salary or whether it's on production based, which I tend to favor because it helps keep a practice on margin, but I don't see a lot of practices actually saying to them, hey, come in on production base, here's what you're likely going to make, um, which I think could be more of a value added aspect than just saying, here's your formula based on the revenue that you bring in. Um, the total per hour, the effort on an individual unit basis, that's called, is considered important because it ties in what am I making to the asked contribution. So a 50 hour, a 60 hour work week with no payment on call for $130,000 starting salary is very different than a 35 or 40 hour work week. So, you know, I think conveying the commitment, even uh, there's been more of a recognition of this among some of the um, aggregators who are now actually offering salaries on an hourly basis. So they've boiled it right down to per hour. So you're here longer, you get paid, and then they can translate what that would mean 
into a particular given work week. I think the third one, the, what we call the consistency of the commitment versus the wage really goes to um, what they're going to be asked to do. So what am I going to be asked to do? Here's your schedule, but really, what am I gonna do? How many times am I gonna be on the road? How many days will I have in surgery? How much time in the front office? And so on. So that kind of consistency of the commitment, if that does not meet their expectation, you get very unhappy veterinarians there yeah, very quickly. Um, in fact, um, veterinary economics, I think a few years ago, looked at why do we have turnover? And the number one reason was unmet contractual expectations. And I would throw that on both parties, the veterinary associates coming in, not for asking, but also the ones writing the contract for not giving them this kind of detail on the consistency and the commitment. You know, the core benefits want to see progression in that with seniority. And again, the definition of mentorship and training, which are different um, and are separate, as the uh, candidate employee sees it, um, kind of where is it that they feel they need training and skills? Where is it they feel mentorship when it comes to a particular situation? So those five things were ranked the highest for newer grads in the assessment of the workplace and a differentiating feature when it comes to them on recruiting versus you know, somebody saying full-time associate required for practice in suburban Calgary, progressive practice, practicing high quality medicine, you know, applicants send resume here. It's amazing how many of those are still out there, you know, that are very much copycats. So as you move along a little bit, and the reason that I put that uh, mid-career up, it's a longer stage. Many of you may be looking at experienced vets rather than newer graduates coming in. And what you see here in kind of the same survey is you see, start to see a shift in motivators for them to say, I've been out a while and now I'm looking for something that's a little more permanent. I'm gonna be likely a little bit less mobile. I'm a little bit older. I know what I'm looking for. I know where I wanna be. And really what starts to come up and where I wanna dovetail to in this talk is um, looking at, well, what are equity options now? What are potential equity options? And you know, the trade-off for an owner is, I'm gonna be here for a while. I don't want a partner. I don't want someone eroding my equity and so on. We see the corporate aggregator starting to offer hybrid models to bring in associates as, um, you know, as uh, potential minor partners. And I think some innovative models that will potentially allow veterinarians to reinvest in their practices as well. But certainly compensation is up there. Continuing skills development is up there and so on as well. This is what more experienced associates down here near the bottom identify as what they consider growth opportunities. So integration and immersion in practice kind of is really the theme to flag and recruitment for earlier career turns more into growth opportunities as well. So let's talk a little bit about what potentially those are. And these will be kind of newer concepts, I think, um, because I think the rest of it can be captured in an offer, can be captured in a message, you know, any of those what we call features of a job. Um, once you maybe are a little bit or, or individuals are a little bit more aware of what at that life stage they're saying are motivators for them, you can include in your screening and your recruitment and so on as well. But the equity share considerations is a growing area in veterinary medicine on ways to do that as well. So everybody here will be familiar with the traditional partnership where in order to create veterinary security, in order to make me attractive for uh, succession to no matter who it is, um, whether it's to a corporate aggregator or whether it's to a group of independent vets, depending on you know, the metrics of your practice and whether or not you'd be attractive to them and so on as well. I mean, the existing partnership has been around for a long time, which simply is a model where a practice has maybe one owner that owns 100% of the practice. They dilute, say, take on a 50% partner. They get a lump sum payment, and now they have a partner as well. And they operate jointly, whether it's one or more owners. Certainly, veterinary medicine has had partnerships that have lasted years and years and years, and some where they go in maybe a little bit too much of a honeymoon sort of phase type of thing you know, without setting expectations in terms of a shareholder agreement and the partnership, you know, struggles and has difficulties. And these can be very difficult to unwind 
when they break up. Another concern on a traditional partnership is, you know, if I want to sell to a corporate consolidator down the road, because their financing model is very different for two reasons, their cost of capital or what they buy practices for is zero compared to a traditional debt finance one, and they can achieve tremendous scale in what they're buying. You know, am I going to lose control over that option to maybe get a bigger exit price when I leave? And maybe I don't want to sell right away. Now, generally speaking, when I have veterinarians that are looking to get into potential partnerships, you know, because it really is like another marriage or long-term commitment, you know, I put them something through what I call kind of a date before you commit type quiz and go over. I'm not even going to go over all of these because it goes on for a few pages, but these are all the content items you should have in a shareholders or partners agreement to set expectations. Clearly, that's only page one. There's page two. A lot of decision making, a lot of governance issues, and a lot of things that can go wrong um, when it comes to life's events and so on as well. So again, but it is a model to meet a high risk equity retention strategy for a veterinarian that is ranking that highly and does not want to just work as an associate and maybe is tapped out on the amount of uh, salary and benefits they can get, which, which does happen. They start looking for more um, those experienced vets as well. So, John, oh, yep. John, uh, I just had one person who wanted to just go back to the prior list. So not, I assume it was the first of the questions. I assume. This list? I think so. Yeah. And I had one other very quick question, sorry. It was just when we were taught, referring to this particular study that was done, there was a question about whether this was specifically companion animal. No, no. Which, which one, the motivators? Yes. No, it is not, it is across the board, okay, gender-wise and species-wise as well. Super, thank you. Yep, obviously somebody who's gonna be wanting to live rurally or has that sort of connection, you know, will be looking for a different lifestyle, but in terms of the job motivators, no, they are uniform. Yeah, and like I said, I don't mind sharing these slides. If I went through these one by one, we'd be here till four o'clock on these two slides. So, so what I want to introduce is a new concept. I have nine or ten clients that did this. It's kind of, and there's a number that are um, considering um, doing this as well. It's the concept of what we call phantom ghost or shadow stock. And remember, this is to cater to basically four and five veterinarians who've been out for a while who are saying, you know. I don't really have a lot of money I can borrow. I can't compete with the consolidators. I would like to have some investment in a veterinary practice. And maybe I would like to be part of a sale of a veterinary practice, you know, that ultimately will go to a corporate consolidator. I'm a second income earner. You know, I'm a working mom, whatever it is. Um, what opportunity maybe do I have if I can't get my hands on a private practice? So kind of growing in popularity and what this is, basically, and there's really two models for it. This is a veterinary practice that issues what we call notional shares in a practice. So it's not real shares in an incorporated practice. So the notional units of ownership could also be issued in a non-incorporated practice. And there's two types. So the first type is what we call appreciation. And basically the concept behind this is the practice shares the growth in value, calculated value of a practice with an associate or a manager. A number of managers have been cut in on this as well. Or what happens an owner who's trying to retain, they really can't tap their cash flow anymore because you know, they're gonna mess up their pecking order of what they have in terms of associate salaries, or it's just gonna erode their bottom line and their value too much, is what else can I do here that's not going to hit my cash flow? So what they do for a senior employee is they give them what's called full value phantom stock. I'll kind of go through how it works. So basically, if you had a practice with a value of X and say the shares, each share was worth $100 and every practice will have a number of what we call shares out. So, you know, they maybe have, you know, 3000 shares out in this practice. And, uh, you know, if they're worth $100 each, that's going to make the practice worth um, $300,000 or whatever. So the concept, though, I use simple numbers here, is if the practice says, I'm going to allocate 50 of these shares to you at $100 each, basically based on our growth and value of the practice. 
and it appreciates in five years to $150, and that associate had 50 shares, then they would have equity. It's not a lot in this example. The numbers get bigger. They would have equity in this overall value of the practice of $2,500. So these are non-power holding um, equity positions. And we'll go over the advantages and the disadvantages here. They're simple to set up. It's really a simple legal agreement that basically, and, and the concept of phantom stock is basically growth sharing. So it's not eroding any equity that an owner or owners have at the present time. The full stock value, and um, at a client in um, Quebec did this, basically, and they had a manager in a vet who'd been there like for a long time, they were frustrated and didn't see any opportunity for ownership. So they said, you know, what I'm going to do now is we're going to kind of double up. Basically, we're going to give you $5,000 or, or basically notionally designate you in a legal agreement, $5,000. Now it was a bigger number, but conceptually $5,000 now. And then we're going to give you a percentage of the growth so you will have that as well. So what happens at the end of the year, there's no dividend, they have to declare it as profit. Um, there's an updated calculation of value, which is simple to do on an annual basis. And they would collect though a share of whatever percentage of phantom stock they have that is in um, as a percentage of the overall value of the practice. I'll show it to you schematically here in a minute too, which hopefully will make it a little bit clear. So really the pros of this concept or it's easy to set up. There's no real shares issued and it hits that hot, low equity motivation. It's something else besides salary and benefit. You really don't dilute your existing principal as an owner. What you are doing is sharing in the growth of value. It's not profit sharing. It's a growth in calculated value. Easy to figure out objectively, easy for you to pick, easy for you as an owner to pick the percentage. I'd say most people Generally, if there's a norm in our industry, it's probably between five and 15% of the growth in value on these. And for the associates, either dealing with student debt, mortgages, second incomes, risk aversion, whatever it is, as a retention technique, they do not have to put any money in. The other pro there, I don't think I haven't mentioned here, basically there's a vesting period from a few slides ago that says that this doesn't materialize as an overall money you can take out. So say after five years, your associate owns 8% of the value in your practice that's grown like 25% in value. There's a waiting period before they can take that out. It might roll over into a deposit on the practice, but there's a waiting period before they can take that out. And if they leave before that vesting period, what they get is zero. So all that equity that was you were sharing in growth goes back to them. I think the cons are that if the practice value goes down, then there is no growth, nothing to share. You still have 100% of the equity as an owner. Um, if you have an associate that's looking for more or wants to pay out sooner or so on, or simply wants control, this isn't the model for them. The second similar model, which is a little more formal, is something we call a share growth model. And here what happens is you actually set up shares in your practice in a, what we call a series share concept. So say your practice is incorporated, like most of them are now, whatever your shares are in your PC or your management co, let's call those series shares A and B. You would set up series share C, and those series share C have no voting power, but they're actual shares in the business. Um, again, easy to set up, an accountant could do that, you know, probably in a day, um, just have different shares out. They are basically gifted or granted to associates or managers, but the concept is the same. The real difference here is when they are paid their share of the profits, and when they cash out, it actually does come out now as a dividend, where there are real shares versus being taxed as a profit. One of the concerns that always comes up as owners is what if I want to sell and now I have this associate, you know, that's there and they have some shares, not a lot in my practice. The answer is you have total control and what is usually in these deals, both the phantom stock and the share growth, the difference being there's real shares in this one is something we call a tag along or a drag along provision, which basically means you have control of the destiny of the practice. When you choose to sell it, they are dragged along with it, you know, not in a literal sense, or they tag along with it. 
So that associate, if the purchaser of your practice does not want that associate around as an owner, um, is part of the sale, like it or not. Um, so under both models, the current owner still can control it as well. So I'll show you how both models look schematically here. So here you are, say, as the owner, or maybe there's more than one of you of an owner of a $3 million practice. And you don't want a partnership like in the previous kind of uh, cube or whatever that I showed there that starts to erode your ownership. What you would do is kind of like this. So what would happen would be you as the owner or current owners are the dark blue and the light blue. But the practice grows the dark blue and green segment there. And in this particular case, let's say you have an associate or a ma manager and you decide to give them 10% phantom stock or 10% share growth, which again are non-voting, no power shares at all. What would happen is that practice, remember, has it's all about the growth in value, has grown $300,000 in calculated value that whoever's doing, maybe it's an accountant, you know, their experience accountants in business or it's an evaluator or something. But the 10% share growth basically means that $30,000 worth of equity goes to the associate. They don't have to pay any money for that. It's formalized in a legal agreement. If it's a share growth, they get $30,000 worth of non-voting shares. And what do they get out of that? So this is now basically a $3.3 million practice. And you have an associate that owns $30,000 worth of a $3.3 million practice. So, you know, at the outset, it's not a ton, but keep in mind that $30,000 does not hit your cash flow anywhere. It's $30,000 in equity only after the first year that they're going to be able to realize. So 30,000 divided by 3.3 million, if I'm, doing my, if I'm doing my math correctly here, is like 1%. So what they would be entitled to basically is 1% of the distribution of the profits that you would control. So as the practice continues to grow, you know, this equity can be built up you know, easily, depending on the percentage in the side of a practice, you know, can get up to a six-figure number in terms of an entitlement down the road after the vesting period. It's also conceivable that you could do it with multiple associates. So here, you know, you have the same practice, $3.3 million, $3 million rather to start, which is 100% equity for the existing owners, grows 400,000 in value. But now a second associate comes along and you still have the first one. And maybe it's the second year now, it's grown 400,000 in value and you've got a 10% uh, share growth or phantom stock deal with the first, who basically is entitled now to forty thousand dollars, ten percent of four hundred thousand, and you got a second one who's only five percent is entitled to twenty thousand dollars. In the group of practices that that I was managing partner over have here in Ontario, we did this in we called them junior partners, and we did this with series shares, and we did this in four separate locations. Eventually, after a trial period, I guess or a kind of an incubation period or just a vesting period, they were able to roll that uh, accumulated equity over into shares in all the practice group, had a full tag along provision. So when the practices were sold, you know, it couldn't be stopped um, by junior partners as well. So it's a little bit different model that also could work if you are an owner of a group of practices and say you have two practices and you have an associate who works only in practice one. Well, then what you would do is you would have a series of shares, and this is not complicated accounting, created that could be, say, type, I think I have them on the next slide here. They could be, say, type B and C series shares that could be uh, growth stock, phantom stock, or share growth for your associates in practice one. And then you could have another associate working in practice two, who would have series shares for practice two only. So you can really compartmentalize it for those of you um, that are multiple practice owners and so on. So a little bit different, but definitely gaining some traction, frankly, as salaries start to get to about as maximum as they can go and practices look to differentiate themselves and look to say, okay, what is it kind of that motivates that associate 
in that career stage that I'm looking for, because there is a line between the earlier grads and when they get a little bit further along as well. So again, this just kind of explains that as well. So the concept again is shared equity based on growth. You know, if you're in a generous mood, some practice owners will share the equity based on where I'm at so far. But I think a lot of owners who have taken the risk up to this point in time and their employees haven't, um, even though they may have helped build the practice value, you're the one that took the risk as the owner. You're the one made the investment, has taken on the business, the personal risk and worrying about the competitors all the time. You know, you're the one that should really be um, entitled to 100% of the equity in my in my opinion, even though we do see some what I could call hometown discounts as well. So here, just kind of an example, you know, practice A is worth 3 million at inception, five years later, it's worth 4 million. Then what you would have would be an associate on 10% who now has no cash in $100,000 worth of equity it vests at this five year period. So they would have the option to take their 100,000 out, you have to be prepared at some point, you may have to pay them out or you can roll it over. A little more complicated to set up when there are real shares, but nothing like buying and selling a practice. And again, if the optic and the contractual veterinary stability is there, I can tell you as someone whose day job basically is dealing with transition and practices, no matter where you're going, that is a key risk metric. So sharing a little bit of equity here often comes back as a very positive thing when a purchaser is looking at how much risk is there um, in your business and how much veterinary stability you have, the more you have, the more it's gonna ultimately drive up the sale price you're gonna receive for your practice. So kind of just to summarize this, really the pros of this, again, just to repeat kind of some points on the earlier slide, you know, protect the cash flow, protect your margin, um, overpaying vets and kind of eroding the margin. Again, if those veterinarians, your associates, aren't producing in revenue, professional revenue, somewhere in the neighborhood of about five times what you're paying them, I guarantee you, unless they're really high producing vets, they're pushing you off margin. And if you're pushed off margin as an owner, you know, your true profit margin, remember the exit value of a practice you know, is the risk as reflected in an exit multiple, what we call the multiple or capitalization of earnings, times your normalized profit or EBITDA, sometimes it's called, you're overpaying staff or vets, there's no way ar around the erosion that happens in that if they are not keeping you on margin. So this is a way really not to affect your margin and convey veterinary stability. And again, the math, the setup behind it, um, really not that complicated and you still have control over the destiny and the practice. Not right for everybody, um, but I think it's right enough for a number uh, that I think we're seeing it um, emerging. I spent a lot of time with data in the US market and it's growing leaps and bounds here. You know of eight or nine people here in Canada that have done it. And all, one practice actually did it actually for eight separate staff members, veterinarians and managers all at the same time. Didn't give them very big percentages or, you know, they wouldn't have anything left for themselves. But at the same time, all of them kind of fit the mold of where they were in their life stage. Didn't want to put any money into a practice. We're concerned about the risk, just generally risk averse people not willing to take those on. But obviously, you're going to have some associates that want to take over um, the whole thing. So I had to bounce off a few things today. I think I'm six minutes um, in front of the top of the hour. Enid, I know you had a closing slide, so I'm going to stop sharing. I'm happy to share these or answer any questions. That's my contact information for um, the time being there. So really the goal of this, and I think our series here, you know, with CVMA was just, you know, to present a couple of out of the box ideas, some of the uh, research and data that's um, being shown um, to affect veterinarians decisions. But again, I wish I had a magic bullet to overcome the fact that we've got a demand growth than a demand scenario bigger than the supply right now. So the key really is um, to differentiate um, as best you can. So I'll turn it back over to you, Aiden. All right, thank you so much, John. I, I really appreciate uh, all of the information. It was, uh, it was, it was a lot to take in and uh, I, I think we've got a lot to think about. And as a, as a present owner, I know that, that these types of things uh, have create much more creative ways of retaining our, our staff, and I really appreciate that. Um, I did have one little question before we finish. Uh, it was from 
Dr. Lawson, Trevor Lawson, one of our soon to be uh, vice president of CVMA. And his question was that we have been seeing quite a, a change um, and we've been hearing a lot and seeing a lot within our new graduates that there's less interest in, in ownership as we see it. And how do you see, I mean, we've seen lots of creative ways of retaining these, these newer grads and younger um, members of our team, but how do you see that in the future as far as retention? Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with that. I think when you look at ownership, though, you know, there's so many different models for ownership, even inside the corporate aggregation and so on as passive or active owners. You know, when you poll the students, you know, as VBMA did this across the U.S. and Canada, there's interest in equity positions and, you know, there is interest in ownership. I think where there is less interest is I'm going to do it all on my own. Um, so when you look at, if you break it down into like what I'd call fractional models, like I'll share ownership, where we only have to come in three or four days a week and so on, you know, there's interest in that. Um, but certainly, Trevor's right, when it comes to kind of the traditional, one veterinarian replaces one veterinarian as a full-time mm -hmm. equivalency in ownership. But the motivators behind that, you know, in a way are kind of unfortunate, you know, it's part of the belief I'll never be able to own a practice because the aggregators are going to get them all. Basically, mm -hmm. um, you know, I can't compete with them and so on. Certainly, I think there's been a real surge in startups um, in the past year and so on as well for that proportion. Mm -hmm. um, but Trevor's right. Yeah, on a one to one basis or a full time equivalency basis, whether it's a reflection of the demographic that's graduating and moving into their ownership years now or whether it's an effect of the marketing that they're hearing and the trends that they're seeing, you know, I think it's a combination of both. Right. Thank you. And, and, uh, and that may go back to frankly, you know, frankly, selection at the vet school level too. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't discount that. And I, I appreciate too. And, and as a, as somebody who is teaching uh, the faculty, uh, the newer grads coming out, that this is, uh, I think, important for them to know that, that, what are opportunities that are out there and how is this a changing field of our profession? So I really appreciate that this is something that you can take back to the students, which is great. Um, I'm going to stop sharing just because I can't read the chats unless you want to take a look. We've got like two more minutes left um, before we'll sign out. So I just wanted to make sure that we uh, have any good questions coming up. Yeah, let me see if I can buzz through them quick. Okay. Uh, first one was okay. Trevor's mm -hmm. answered. Is that for types of all types of practice? We answered that. Yeah, that is all types. Yeah. So we've got um, one question. Is it across species that vets should be making five times their salary? Um, no, but it's close, really. I mean, it's it definitely is the benchmark in um, companion animal practice. I would say you know, it drops off a little bit, particularly when you have a mobile function and there's less kind of throughput and clients and in mobile equine and food animal practices. But, you know, if you look at the productivity measures and certainly in our BMJ data bank and stuff, I would say you're certainly in the foreign change as well. But those are hard, you know, when you see now new grads going out 140, 150,000, they're happy, but you know, that metric is hard to hit for practices to keep them on margin. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I can just add to a couple of things. The Canadians were part of that AVMA survey. So it kind of is a blend there. Um, proportional of the population. One question was off the slides. I don't mind sharing those. How often would you do evaluation if you had phantom or share growth? It really depends on how often you want to realize it. So if you said, you know what, we'll realize your equity growth uh, every six months, you could do it every six months. If it's, every, if it's every year, you could do it every year. If it's every two years, you could say, we'll recalculate this every two years. And you know, really, from the point of view of analytics, it's really the first time through that's kind of the biggie for those. You know, doing updates in a short period of time should be like something that can be done really in a, in a couple of hours by an accountant or evaluator and so on as well. Um, we had a, a, just a question about whether we would be sharing all of these slides. So this actually, this entire presentation will be available to be watched because it's being recorded. So it will be available on the CVMA website. And so you can take a look at that there and you'll obviously see the slides when you're watching it again. Um, and uh, I had a small question just 
it was personally to me, but I think it was meant to be going to, to as a general question of, you know, the comment of how many associates actually know that they should be producing five times their salary. Um, and I, I can answer that question personally, they don't. <laughs> so yeah. possibly they should, but they, they don't. And I, I think that's something we need to remind them of that we are working in a business. But um, yeah. I, I, I try, try and that. drill it into them, but it becomes <laughs> sometimes irrelevant when it comes to compensation and really trying to meet the practice needs as well. I agree. Yeah. And I, and I think, too, like we've seen, you know, right now it is a changing, a changing area. We've got a very big demand. So these things become less important to those people that are in demand. Um, and it's more difficult for those of us that are, as you showed in those first slides of your presentation, John, uh, for those of us that are on the other side of things and, and having to, um, to take out some of the risk that we're having and, and put it in some of the benefits that we may be having at this point. Uh, and bringing it back to our our employees, but I think it's a it's a it's a new way, and and I I'm feeling very optimistic about it. In fact, I think this is kind of good for our profession, and I, I'm going to to leave it at this just very briefly to say uh, again a very big thank you to Dr. Tate for uh, coming on board today and sharing his lunchtime with us. Uh, again, I wish we could all be together in person, and I really really hope that that will come in the near future. Uh, we have our next two webinars coming up in the following Wednesdays, so please do join us then. And of course, I'd like to say uh, thank you to the CVMA and to Sarah Cunningham specifically, who's behind that black slide that says Canadian Vet Medical Association, for setting these up. Um, and for our entire council for being so incredibly supportive of this time uh, in our profession and looking to research to find ways that we can uh, help with the current situation of our workforce shortage uh, and how we can keep people safe and happy in our profession. It's of a priority of ours. So on that note, um, I'll let you all go. And again, uh, thank you very much and have a good rest of your day.